Gentlemen, welcome upstairs at the National Constitution Center. <laughs> You heard the passion of Professor Gates downstairs and of all of our colleagues, so we're just going to jump right into this conversation. The one thing I have to say is I think you can tell it is urgently important to bring as many school kids as possible to come see that incredible exhibit. And that is why I'm thrilled that last week, Dr. William Height, the superintendent of the school district of Philadelphia sat with me up on this overlook and announced that the school district and the Constitution Center are launching a program to bring tens of thousands of Philly school districts to the Constitution Center every year. Wow. We're calling it the Constitutional Ambassadors Program. We're going to go seek support, and those great kids are going to start the experience in their classroom, come see that Civil War exhibit and see the Constitution Center, and then connect to classrooms around the country using our virtual constitutional exchanges for hour-long conversations about the Constitution moderated by a judge or a master teacher. Wow, that's it, great. It is an amazing project, and we're so excited to share it with you. All right. Uh, uh, Professor Gates does need no introduction. He is uh, author of this best-selling book, Stony the Road, Reconstruction, White Supremacy, and the Rise of Jim Crow, which is the companion book to the Pathbreaking series, which has just run on PBS. The book is superb. It tells the story with more vivid detail and more powerful images than I've seen before of how the promise of Reconstruction, which we saw in the gallery, was brutally thwarted by the South and uh, the heroic efforts of African American intellectuals and others to try to resurrect that promise. We're going to jump right into the conversation, but before we start, we're going to see a clip from the series. Let us watch it now. Most of us know that our country fought a civil war in the 1860s, but less is known about what came afterward the chaotic, exhilarating, and ultimately devastating period known as Reconstruction. Did you ever study Reconstruction in school? No. A paragraph or two. We never really studied it. I didn't learn anything about Reconstruction. Reconstruction was our shining moment. It's the second founding of our country. Overnight, people who have been defined as property take leadership positions in the South. So this is an incredibly heady moment, kind of like Barack Obama becoming president. But those black folks had no idea of the cliff they were heading towards. Reconstruction produced a violent backlash, a racist backlash. I want us to tell the truth about our history, not to punish America. Mm -hmm. I want to liberate us, but we can't get to liberation if we don't acknowledge what we've done. It's our town now! Do you believe that we as a nation are still undergoing the process of reconstruction? You might almost say it never ended. We are still trying to come to terms with the consequences of the end of slavery in this country. This is a chapter of our history that's been misrepresented and misunderstood. It's time that we acknowledge the true story and complete the work of reconstructing America. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to correct one thing that you said. You said that every school child in Philadelphia should see this exhibition. Every school child in America should see this You're exhibition. You're here, absolutely this is the, right. The most amazing exhibition about this reconstruction that I've ever seen. I learned things on our tour that I, did, I had never seen the different drafts of the three reconstruction amendments. So thank you, and thank members of the board and all the people who support this marvelous uh, center for making this education possible. Because we never really have dealt with the issues raised by Reconstruction. Thank you so much for that. I learned so much from that interactive too. 
I'll ask you what you learned, but also what you want Americans to know about those Reconstruction Amendments themselves, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Well, one of the most interesting things, the 13th Amendment, of course, abolished slavery, December 6, 1865. Um, most people know it now because of Ava DuVernay's documentary, who didn't know it before, because we were raised to think the Emancipation Proclamation abolished slavery, and of course it didn't. Historians think maybe half a million, um, four million enslaved people were able to get behind union lines and therefore gain their freedom before the end of the Civil War. But the institution of slavery was only abolished by the ratification of the 13th Amendment. The 14th, as you said so eloquently, uh, the Equal Protection Clause, and birthright citizenship. You ever wonder where birthright citizenship came from? Um, Charles Sumner and his colleagues were trying to figure out what is the status of these people who are, had been property for a quarter of a millennium, a quarter of a millennium. Um, and they came up with birthright citizenship, which is, was brilliant, actually. Um, and then finally, that's 1868, and then finally, the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which effectively gave black men the right to vote. It said that race could not be used to prevent or prohibit any um, American from um, voting. But what's very curious about the, the 15th Amendment is that black people in the South who had been um, formerly enslaved and free in the 10 of the 11 Confederate states got the right to vote three years before. This is a surprise. It was a surprise to me when I started um, doing research for what became our series. And it's a surprise, I think, for most of you, that if you were a former slave or had been free in the South, it was, it was one of the four Reconstruction Amendments that gave black men the right to vote. vote. And that was the, what we call the first freedom summer. The Freedom Summer of 1867, when 80.5% of all eligible black men in 10 of the 11 Confederate states registered to vote. But here's the kicker. You know how we demonize the South as opposed to the North, and we have a fantasy that there was no racism in the North? If you were free, I descend from three sets of free Negroes, as we would have said, um, as they would have called themselves. Two sets were free by the um, outbreak of the, the American Revolution. The third set on my, father, on my mother's side, the third set on my father's mother's side were free in 1823. They lived 30 miles from where I was born. I have a tremendous amount of stability in my family. It's now in um, West Virginia, but it was in Virginia at that time. So, and my fourth great grandfather, John Redmond, actually fought in the American Revolution. And because of him, he was a free Negro, because of him, my brother, Dr. Paul Gates, and I are members of the Sons of the American Revolution. Go figure, you know. <laughs> 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 Not exactly a predominantly black organization, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, hold this in mind. West Virginia becomes a state. It joins the Union in the middle of the Civil War. It becomes a state June 20th, 1863. My, and they had, my free Negro ancestors, had cousins just across the border around Winchester, Virginia. Those cousins who had been enslaved got the right to vote three years before my free ancestors got the right to vote because in the North, Black men could only vote in the five New England states and in the state of New York if you satisfied a $250 property requirement. Isn't that amazing? Nice. That is so shocking, but it is true. And even when West Virginia uh, became a state, they refused to give black men in West Virginia. They ain't that many black people in West Virginia today, so you know, we're only talking about a handful of people. But they refused to give them um, the right to vote. So it was those four um, Reconstruction Acts that really laid the groundwork for citizenship and um, for the right to vote. Now, I first studied Reconstruction, I didn't study it at all in, in high school in Piedmont, West Virginia, but I studied it at Yale. My sophomore year, 
I took um, a two semester survey course, Introduction to Afro American History. Oliver, where are you? We were Afro Americans at that time. You remember that, right? <laughs> and the um, Professor William McFeely, who went on to get a Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Ulysses S. Grant, had us read W.E.B. Du Bois's book, Black Reconstruction, published in 1935. And it was radical because it challenged the Dunning School of historians at Columbia University, and they were part and parcel of the mythology of Reconstruction being a dismal failure and an embarrassment to the history of American democracy. And Du Bois took on the Dudding School. And Eric Foner, the chief consultant to our series, is, it's so ironic that he is our leading Reconstruction historian at Columbia University. It's almost as if, I think he's about to publish his 10th book on Reconstruction on the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which will be out in, in September. I think it's a personal mission for him to refute the terribly racist claims made by the Dunning School, his own predecessors in the history department at Columbia, and set the record straight. Um, so McFeely had us read Du Bois's book, Black Reconstruction, and then a book by Rayford Logan. Now, most of you haven't heard of Rayford Logan, but Rayford Logan was uh, the third or the fourth black man to get a PhD in history from Harvard. And at one time, he was engaged to Letitia Gates, who happens to be my great aunt. So I'm very uh, biased about Rayford Logan. But he wrote a book called The Betrayal of the Negro. And it's about the period immediately following Reconstruction. Reconstruction, people argue about it, but generally accepted dates 1865 to 1877. So Du Bois's book ends in 1877. Logan's book begins in 1877. And that is the period of the rollback to Reconstruction. And it takes a while to roll it back because black men had an enormous amount of power. Black people were in the majority, South Carolina, Mississippi, Louisiana, almost in the majority, Florida, Alabama, um, and, uh, Flo and Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. So there were 16 black men elected to Congress between 1870 and 1877, including two United States senators. In South Carolina, um, Speaker of the House, Secretary of State, the, uh, one of the great moments of the film, I go to Jim Clyburn's uh, office, and he has all the Reconstruction congressmen on, on his wall, and he could do a whole black history, a black history lesson. But systematically, step by step, the redemptionists, the former Confederates, wrote the South indeed rose again, and they disenfranch disenfranchised those black men. And they did it in such a clever way. You couldn't, um, you, what are you going to do? The 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments are ratified, right? So you can't get rid of them, but you could go around them. And starting in 1890 with something called the Mississippi Plan, there were state constitutions, which then unfolded over the next 16 years in each of the former Confederate states. And that's when they established poll taxes, literacy tests, comprehension tests that only a law professor um, could possibly understand. And you want to know how dramatically effective these um, state constitutional conventions were? Louisiana, one of the majority black states, in 1898, before their state constitutional convention, had uh, 130,000 black men registered to vote. The new constitution was ratified in 1898. By 1904, that number of 130,000 black men registered to vote had been reduced to 1,342. The, there were 2,000 black men elected to office, according to Eric Foner. Um, during the Reconstruction period. The last Reconstruction congressman, uh, George Henry White, bids farewell to the Congress in 1901. And there wouldn't be another black man elected to the Congress until 1929, when Oscar de Priest from Chicago is elected to Congress. How is he elected to Congress? Because all those black people took part in the Great Migration went from Mississippi, particularly to Chicago, went from Mississippi and the other southern states north, and because of the 15th Amendment, they had the right to vote. 
And so they vote a northerner in to um, the Congress. So I, for my introduction to Reconstruction was coterminous with an introduction to its rollback. And that's why we made a four hour series. The first two hours are about Reconstruction, the great heights that um, black people achieved just out of slavery, and this great moment when Lincoln's uh, desire for a new birth of freedom was realized, our first experiment with interracial democracy. And it was greeted by the rise of white supremacy. I said that the 13th was ratified December 6th, 1865. The Ku Klux Klan was invented December 1865. There were eight pogroms or massacres major between 1866 and 1876, starting in Memphis, um, ending in ha Hamburg, um, South Carolina in 1876. So this was, was not an untroubled period. There, uh, the Ku Klux Klan hearings, and all these uh, volumes are you know, online now, and you could read them. Uh, that's the closest that we've come in this country to a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. When Grant sent troops to suppress the Ku Klux Klan. And they asked all these black people who had been victimized by the Ku Klux Klan because they had been trying to vote. Women were raped, black men were lynched, they were beaten, they were threatened, they were even bribed, uh, or there were offers of bribe to keep them from voting because they had so much power. And I think that the manifestation, the expression of all that power, not only uh, scared the, the daylights out of the former South, as you might expect, right? But I don't think the North was ready for all that black power either. Because the North was complicitous with the rollback of Reconstruction. Certainly, you could see signs by 1872. 1873 is the first Great Depression in the United States. It's called the Panic now. It's called the Panic of 1873. But until the Great Depression, starting in the 1929, it was called the the Great Depression. They're looking around saying, do we really need to protect these slaves? Aren't they free? Can't they stand on their own feet? How are you going to enslave people for a quarter of a millennium? 250 years and expect them to stand on their own feet after a mere 12 years. But that's exactly what happened. The Hayes-Tilden Compromise, presidential election 1876, it was deadlocked in 1877. The Compromise one of the agreements of the compromise was federal troops would be, the few remaining federal troops protecting black people's right to vote would be withdrawn and black people would be on their own. And the Supreme Court was complicitous. 1876, the Cruikshank decision and the death knell. The scholars argue about when Reconstruction was over. Black people basically had a funeral at, the, uh, at a big church in Washington, 1883, right after the Supreme Court said that the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which established equality, social equality as it was called then. Black people could ride in streetcars and stay in hotels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Supreme Court said that was unconstitutional. And Frederick Douglass, Blanche K. Bruce, the former United States Senator, John Mercer Langston, Richard T. Greener, the uh, first black graduate of Harvard, all gathered in the church, and the church was packed just like this. And Langston spoke. And it was, they just said, how could the country do this to us? How could they abandon us? How could they throw us to the wolves in the way that, that they have done? It was, Du Bois said famously, if, if you want to think about the rise and fall of black freedom, um, the slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, and then moved back towards slavery again. And that is the history of the rise and fall of Reconstruction. Thank you for the most succinct, riveting, and incredibly moving account of the rise and fall of Reconstruction. I've heard you have in the book the funeral that African Americans held for slavery after the Civil War, and then to think that another funeral was held for Reconstruction after the Civil Rights decision is stunning. You have this picture in the book of the first 
uh, colored senators and representatives uh, in New York, and then the evisceration. And what's so incredible about what you just said was how central the right to vote was. Now I understand why Frederick Douglass said that the right to vote was the most important of the group, because African Americans were a majority in so many states, and why the evisceration of the right to vote was the core of redemption. Tell us more about how the racist redemption-based uh, backlash eviscerated the right to vote through Supreme Court decisions, through terrorist violence, and through discriminatory laws like poll taxes and literacy tests. Oh, sure. But could you do me a favor? Could you hold up that yeah, the lithograph? Amazing. This lithograph is from 1872. I don't know if they could it's a uh, little, see it. In the back, maybe you can't quite But see it's it. famous. It's called yeah, yeah. The First Colored Senator and uh, U.S. Representatives. And do you know that during the Depression, the Federal Writers Project sent writers uh, to interview former slaves, people obviously who would have been very, very young by the end of the Civil War, still alive in the 1930s. And in these um, very small, often they were former um, homes occupied by slaves on plantations, right? They found, um, you know, grease-covered, faded copies of that 1812 lithograph. You know how the way that people, you go to a black home, there's Jesus and Martin Luther King, and yeah, now there's Jesus, Martin Luther King, and Barack Obama, you know? <laughs> they had that, that lithograph. And I studied that, um, the history of that lithograph. Three of those um, men were born free. And we tend to forget, and one was English. Um, Robert Brown Elliott was, um, um, born free in Liverpool. There was so much action, so much excitement about Reconstruction that Eliot shows up in Boston. He's part of the British Navy, born free in Liverpool, educated. He's part of the British Navy, shows up in Boston, hears about all this opportunity in South Carolina, goes to South Carolina. Richard Harvey Kane had been moved by the AME Church from New York to revitalize Mother Emanuel, and you all know Mother Emanuel because that's where the nine martyrs were, were um, so horribly murdered that day. Richard Harvey Kane, great entrepreneur, starts a, a black newspaper and hires um, Elliot to work for him, and then Elliot runs for the state legislature and then, and then for the Congress. When Richard Greener graduates from Harvard in 1870, endless opportunities, does he go to New York? Does he go to Boston? Stay in Boston? Does he go to Philadelphia? No, he goes to Charleston, South Carolina, because that's where, that's where uh, the action was. We can't imagine it today. You can't imagine um, how much promise and energy and optimism. Think about it. Think about what that was like if you had been enslaved up to 1865. Endless horizon, then boom. Tw within 12 years, all gone. It's just um, horrible to contemplate. I often, as a person, I was born in 1950. I often think, Oliver, I'm sure you do too, what it would have been like to be black with the same capacities that we have now. You wouldn't have gone to Oxford. I wouldn't have gone to Cambridge. I wouldn't have gone to Yale. Where were you an undergraduate? At Lincoln. Oh, the historically black Lincoln University. Right on, my brother. <laughs> The first, of course you were. <laughs> we would not have had those, uh, those opportunities. And I can imagine the heartbreak. When you read the speeches made that day at that church in 1883, and then Douglas went to Lincoln Hall three days later and made um, another speech separately about the betrayal of the Negro. And you ask, why would they do this? Well, what remained the leading export from the United States and through the 1930s, cotton. Somebody had to pick that cotton. And you were moving from an economy where the labor was free, ostensibly, right, as performed by slaves, and it needed to be replaced to maximize profits with a form of what? Neo-slavery. So sharecropping, debt peonage, uh, vagrancy laws. If you saw three black men, four black men on the street, they could be arrested put on the chain gang. You know all those images of chain gangs? That's where they all come from. Um, uh, between 1889 and, and 1930 or so, 
3,700 black men are lynched in the name of many, many, not all, but many accused of rape, raping white women, right? Both Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington pointed out that nobody was accused, virtually, was accused of raping a white woman during the Civil War in the South when the masters were away fighting and the male slaves were black, back on the plantation. Think about that, isn't that curious? Lynching was a trope that was invented as part of a larger, larger white supremacist rhetorical superstructure. And one of the um, uh, uh, fascinating things that I figured out when we were making the series, in particular when I was writing the book, was this was the, the time of America's first social media war. It was a battle between these confected images of black people as thieves, liars, venal, deracinated, Sambo art, we call it. And this book is full of, uh, every chapter is followed by a visual essay comprised of these horrible images which we all have seen, They're called, it's called memorabilia now. But black skin, thick red lips, wide white eyes with uh, black pupils, um, and wild hair, and these were black men stealing chickens, black people eating watermelons, um, black people, in male and female, in every exa exaggerated, humiliating form through which you can represent a human being. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these images are produced after the fall of Reconstruction, and particularly in the 1890s. Why in the 1890s? Technological accident. Chromolithography is invented earlier in the century, but it becomes cheap in the 1890s, so that you can widely distribute four-color images in advertisements, trade cards, postcards, posters, on games. So it was possible for a middle-class white family, from the time your alarm clock went off, because these images were everywhere, you'd hit an alarm clock and you'd see Sambo staring at you on the alarm clock. You put your feet down in bedroom slippers and there would be a Sambo or Aunt Jemima figure staring up that had been embroidered into your bedroom slipper. You go to have uh, breakfast and your tea cozy was a Sambo image. Your egg cups had Sambo images on them. You would go to work and you come home, what's the fav one of the favorite parlor games? 10 Little Niggers. That was the, one of the favorite parlor games in America at that time, everywhere a white person saw an image of a black person, it was of a Sambo. It was of this racist caricature. The whole point was to create a subliminal hypnotic effect so that when you, my colleague, uh, uh, now departed, Barbara Johnson, who's a genius, wants to find a stereotype as an already read text. Think about how brilliant that is an already read text. What does that mean? I can look at you, you're black. I don't see you, I see Sambo, I see Aunt Jemima. I know exactly who you are because the society has confected an image superimposed on who you really are. And you are forced to live up to or down to, however you might want to put it, that racist image of yourself. So what did black people do? they fought back with their own concept called the New Negro. The talented tent, the educated black people say, all right, well, we can't win this war. Maybe what you're saying is true about the uneducated black people. But we are educated, refined. It, it's, the, the concept starts in uh, about 1890. We used to think it was, we, uh, I wrote the book, it said it started in 1894, and a scholar wrote to me, Last week it said, no, no, it started 1877 and I got the essay. So I said, okay, now it starts at 1877. <laughs> but the point is they fought back this um, concept of Sambo with the concept of the new Negro. And the new Negro was everything that the so-called old Negro or Sambo or Uncle Tom wasn't. And um, Du Bois even globalized the new Negro, W.E.B. Du Bois, first black man to get a PhD from Harvard in history. The Paris World's Fair, it's called the Paris Exposition in 1900. Du Bois curated the Negro exhibit 
and he took uh, 363 photographs of black people, many of whom were not even visibly black because he wanted to show the um, genetic diversity of the African American community and they're all of course upper class black people because he's trying to defeat this racist image that had been created by the redemptionist movement with the rise of white supremacy. It was true in art, it was true in novels, it was true in folklore, even if you read Joel Chandler Harris's um, Uncle Remus tales, and Joel Chandler Harris did a lot to preserve traditional black folktale. Sometimes though, he'll put words in Uncle Remus's mouth like, um, black people, our people don't need the, the right to vote or we don't need all that education. That's a real mistake, a waste of, of energy. It was true with the social sciences and it was true with racial science. You all know about the science of eugenics. Um, Louis Agassiz, you know, the rent, you know those horrible daguerreotypes that he made and one of the, a person who claims that um, they are a descendant is suing Harvard for using those. But Agassiz, who was a professor of zoology, was a stone cold racist, man. I mean, that, <laughs> that was the only way that you could put it. So all these discourses were united, science, social science, art, literature, politics, in order to put that genie back in the lamp, the genie of black freedom, the genie of black masculinity, the genie of the power of the vote. And it was devastatingly effective. Could it have been otherwise? If, if the courts had ruled differently, if the, comp the election had come out the other way, if the compromise of 1876 hadn't happened, could it have come out otherwise? What were the grounds of hope? And, and tell us about the, the title of the book as well and the song that inspired it. One time I asked, um, I'm on board the Aspen Institute, and Madeleine Albright and Condi Rice are um, both on the board. So it was about the time when President Obama was opening up Cuba. Um, that door was open about five minutes <laughs> and then it was shut again. Um, my wife happens to be Cuban and a, and a historian, a Cuban citizen and an historian, so I'm, I'm very partial to Cuba. And now I can go as a family member so nobody can stop me. I just check the family and everything's cool. <laughs> um, so I asked Madeline and uh, Walter Isaacson gave me the first question. So they were debating whatever they were debating. And I asked uh, them, which is more important in terms of, and I use Cuba as the example because it was contemporary, giving people the right to vote or giving them economic freedom, right? And predictably, as you might imagine, Condi said one person, one vote first. Don't open up Cuba unless everyone can vote. Madeline said economic opportunity, economic independence. You give them that, the middle class will rise, and sooner or later, they will demand their rights. And of course, we can see this in China now and, and a couple other places where capitalism is going. I went to China in 1993, there were, 10, there were a billion bicycles. I went back 10 years later and there were a billion BMWs, you know, like, <laughs> I'm like whoa. And I couldn't breathe either. It was like being in a, a time machine going back to uh, London in the <laughs> Dickens time. But um, <laughs> it rained, I went, oh, that's the sky, you know. <laughs> uh, environmental controls had not yet been, been implemented. Why do I raise that? Because I used to wonder, Remember that Booker, Booker T. Washington speech I cited downstairs when he said economics is more important than politics. We are willing to forgo the right to vote if we can develop economically. We can be indispensable to the society if a person, a tradesman, a tradeswoman, a craftsman, a craftswoman is indispensable then no one would why, would, why would you discriminate against the brick mason in Philadelphia or locksmith or whatever um, it might be. Or, but that was Booker T. Washington, but he was opposed to Frederick Douglass, who said the most important thing was the right to vote. So I used to, and I, I teach, I love teaching, that's my day job. And um, I taught a course on Reconstruction and Redemption. I'm, my PhD is in English, so I'm, um, 
I teach in the English department and the Department of African and African American Studies. So this was about the, new, the concept of the New Negro leading up through the Harlem Renaissance, which was in the 1920s originally called the New Negro Renaissance. So I asked the students to play with this. You know, give me a scenario where Booker T. Washington's not an Uncle Tom selling out Frederick Douglass or the race, where to make the case for Booker T. Washington. And a lot of people do. They'll say, look at China, right? Um, if, if black people um, had developed economically. Um, but it, what Washington was training people for was not really going to put them in leading strong positions within a, a soon to be 20th century economy. He was training them more for a 19th century um, model of indus in, in, you know, industry and trade. And many of the lynchings, many of the lynchings, though they were ostensibly in the name of a black man attempting to rape or raping a white woman, when Ida B. Wells started investigating them in 1892, then other uh, people investigated them, including Walter White in the 1920s, it turned out it was economic competition. Ida B. Wells' best friend had a grocery store, a market, and across the street was a white man's. And they, they were, kids were playing marbles, black and white kids, they got into a fight. It led to this huge conflagration and the guy who was jealous of the black man essentially ignited the community in Memphis to lynch the man who, very well educated man, who had started that store with a couple of his partners. And th that example repeated itself throughout the South in, at the heart of these so-called lynchings. Um, and so could economics, if black people had gotten 40 acres and a mule, right? You all know about 40 acres and a mule. Spike Lee's production company is called 40 acres and a mule. Um, that would have been a radical transformation in, in property ownership without a doubt. And the, whole, the concept was that big plantations would be divided up into 40 acre plots given to the former slaves. And it actually was tried. You can read a book by Willie Lee Rose called Re Rehearsal for Reconstruction. When in the, the Georgia Sea Islands, uh, which liberated by the Union Army early in the war, there were plantations that were divided up and black people were given um, parcels of land to develop. The person who single-handedly rolled back that policy was Andrew Johnson. And Andrew Johnson sent General O.O. O. Howard, the first head of the Freedmen's Bureau and a hero of the Civil War, to those black people living on those uh, Georgia Sea Islands to tell them, right off South Carolina, that they had to give the land back to the former masters who had enslaved them. That's horrible. That was a horrible thing. So they never had a chance to own um, land. Never, um, I think by 1900, 20% of the African Americans in the South owned some kind of land. And that was not enough to create an economic base, create a middle class that would have sufficient uh, economic clout to make a real difference. But without the ballot, those economic rights could not be protected. So in, that, in the debate between Condi and Madlin, in terms of specifically black Americans following the Civil War, the most important thing that could have happened to change the fate of interracial democracy in America was protecting the black man's right to vote. And, the, and only men could vote, of course, is why I said black men. And the people who were trying to roll back the Civil War understood that that was the vulnerable point. If we could take away their right to vote by intimidating them, discouraging them, threatening them, killing them, raping them, and then finally after 1890, taking uh, it back through these the dubious state conventions, then we can put them back on the plantation. Then we can call them, so they were slaves by another name. And that's what they did. And not only that, starting uh, with the United Daughters of the Confederacy in 1894, they even published guides to textbooks. 
guides to textbooks about the Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, Mildred Lewis Rutherford, I taught her, um, I, you fact check me, it's either Mildred, Mildred Lewis Rutherford or Mildred Rutherford Lewis, I always get it mixed up. But I taught my graduate course, her book called The Measuring Rod, Rod had 20 principles. And if any book that a librarian was considering purchasing or teacher was considering using in the classroom, if any of those books violated any one of these 20 principles, the order was don't buy it, don't use it, don't teach it. You know what was in there? The Civil War was fought to free the slaves. Jefferson Davis, any book that said anything bad about Jefferson Davis, you, you couldn't do it. That the slaves were mistreated, that they hadn't been happy in their condition, you couldn't do it uh, as a book. That was her common core was the lost cause. And that was the beginning of the lost cause mythology that culminated, well, in physical form with all those Confederate monuments. All those Confederate monuments, I mean, like, li not literally every one, were built in the 1890s in the, first, uh, in the early years of the 20th century. They were the physical manifestation of redemption, of the rise of white supremacy. And when, you, when I uh, heard about the murders at Mother Emanuel Church, at first I thought that anybody who would pray with nine black people, including the preacher, and I did the last interview with Reverend Clementa Pinckney, as it turns out, that anybody who would pray with the people on Wednesday night at a prayer meeting for an hour and then systematically kill them just had to be purely deranged. That, that must be an act, an unfortunate, sad act by someone who was um, suffering from um, um, insane mental condition. But he was a white supremacist. He knew what he was doing. He picked that church because it was the heart of the black community in Reconstruction. And he was quoted as saying, they're stealing our women. They are taking up job opportunities. You know, the, the same kinds of um, lies and heinous accusations that the Nazis made about Jewish people um, in the 1930s. That is the logic of, of white supremacy or the ill logic. That's why if it could happen to black people with the sanction of the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments so close to the Civil War in which now historians estimate 750,000 um, Americans died. If it could happen then to us, to our ancestors, it could happen anywhere and it can happen again. And that's why we have to be vigilant. That's why I did this series. Just to remind everybody that the rights you think are permanent and inviolable can be snatched away at any time. And those of us who love liberty and justice have to fight to defend those rights. Thank <laughs> you.